Tracheal intubation of the critically ill adult patient. The British Journal of Anaesthesia have provided us with some guidelines. Let's talk about Plan A. So Plan A starts with a team brief. Do the team know what they're doing? Do they know we're going to possibly go through stages A to D? Do they know their roles during those stages? So team management and a team brief is crucial in starting Plan A. Next, we need to ensure that the patient is positioned correctly. Ideally, 25 to 30 degrees. Their head should be in the sniffing position if at all possible. Obviously, you've got to bear in mind any, uh, any neck injuries that they may have, but if possible, the sniffing position. This makes it easier to intubate them, makes it in the airway easier to visualize once the laryngoscope is in the mouth. If they're obese, then you might need to get the ear to sternal notch or the ramping position. So you may need to get their head up really quite high. And this is where the 25 to 30 degrees positioning might come in useful as well. Monitoring should be standard. We need an ECG, we need a blood pressure, we need oxygen saturations, we need end tidal capnography. Those are the essential parts of the monitoring that we should have for each of our patients we're about to intubate. Are they in place? Are the leads correctly attached? Is the probe on the finger in the right place? It's not about to fall off. Is our end tidal capnography working correctly? All of this needs to be checked and we need to ensure that we've taken all the measurements and noted them all before we start the procedure. Then we go on to talk about pre-oxygenation and per-oxygenation. Pre-oxygenation is clearly the process that occurs before we start intubating the patient. Per-oxygenation is that oxygenation that takes place once the drugs are in and the process has started. With pre-oxygenation, we should be using a tight fitting face mask at 15 litres a minute, giving around about 100% oxygen for three minutes minimum, trying to wash out all that nitrogen and fill the patient's lungs up with all that oxygen. Very much do not recommend the use of a Hudson type mask as you won't get the tight fit that you need and you're not delivering a good amount of oxygen, certainly not as much as you would like to be doing as well. There's a recognition that you could use a CPAP valve, um, but it's difficult necessarily to titrate the amount of PEEP that you're delivering with something like this. With a patient that's hypoxemic, and let's face it, many of the patients under these circumstances are going to be hypoxemic, then what you're going to need is, or what will be helpful, would be NIV with CPAP as well. So if you can get an NIV mask on, that's been shown to improve patients' oxygenation levels. There is a risk of gastric insufflation with some high pressures, so one needs to be aware of that. Um, but it has been shown to be beneficial. Nasal oxygen is also something that's recommended in the guidelines. So standard nasal cannula, running at about 5 litres a minute at this stage until the patient is asleep, they won't tolerate it much higher than that. And these have been shown to increase the apnea time, um, making the time for you to intubate the patient a little bit longer. There is some mention about high flow nasal oxygen now as well. One of the main problems with these is that it can potentially interfere with the tight seal that you're going to try and get whilst washing out that nitrogen. So some studies have shown some benefits, um, but mechanically it can be quite difficult. Obviously with high flow nasal oxygen you're delivering much higher flows of oxygen, hence the name, 30 to 50 litres a minute. Um, and these have been shown to possibly be beneficial, but like I say, the mechanics of it can make it difficult to use at this point. With the slightly agitated patient, one may need to consider a delayed sequence induction process whereby something like ketamine can be given to help settle the patient a little bit first. If they're very, very agitated, it can make the whole process quite hard. A little bit of ketamine might help settle them and allow you to manage the airway properly before moving down the induction process. So the recommendations at this point are a nice tight fitting face mask, with nasal oxygen, 100% for three minute washout period, where the nasal oxygen is gonna run at five liters a minute, and this will then be increased once the patient is asleep. We then move into the peroxygenation period as they entitle it in this document. And this is where you switch the nasal flow oxygen from five liters a minute up to 15 liters a minute. 
The patient then will tolerate that because they're asleep at this point. Obviously those flow rates are quite high before they're asleep. Once they are asleep you can crank it right up and this has shown to entrain a certain amount of oxygen, um, increasing your apnea time nicely and giving you more chance to get that tube down before the saturations start to drop. Or indeed the use of high flow nasal oxygen as well, uh, once again with those high flow rates could be considered at this point. A two-handed technique might be more appropriate here to help manage the airway. So this is where one person holds the mask and another one uses the bag and they do recommend um, ventilating the patient during this period as well in between attempts. They also go on to say that they would use CPAP where possible, so uh, a bag valve mask with a CPAP va uh, valve on it uh, might be useful as well during um, intubation attempts uh, to help keep those airways open a little better. So during the actual induction process, there is recommendations that bearing in mind that gastric emptying is a big problem here, um, that this should be a modified rapid sequence induction process. So there should be good use of pre-oxygenation, there should be IV induction agents being used, there should be good use of neuromuscular blocking agents, there should be optimal positioning as well. With the actual NG tube, obviously the enteral feeding should have been discontinued, the NG tube should be suctioned as well um, to ensure that um, we can increase the chances of the stomach being empty. Um, cricoid pressure, that should be eased off if necessary and when applying cricoid pressure you need to ensure that the person applying it is actually competent to do so. And again, there's the hint here that CPAP with pre-oxygenation might be the appropriate thing to do. And obviously the use of waveform capnography um, is quite essential at this point. The document then goes on to talk about the induction agents. And there's a recognition that ketamine is becoming an increasingly popular drug of choice here. Also there should be um, opioids used as co-induction agents. And obviously the use of neuromuscular blocking agents are highly recommended. And there's uh, the use of rocuronium over sucks, where rocuronium may give you a little bit longer and doesn't carry some of the side effects that sucks and alcoholine may well do. When the induction process starts, somebody needs to know the time, so somebody needs to be made responsible for that. The fixation of tasks uh, can become a big problem, especially if it starts to become difficult, and it's important that somebody is aware of how much time has actually passed during this procedure. So like I say, that needs to be handed over to somebody in particular. So then comes the actual laryngoscopy, and there's two parts that could make this um, as optimised as possible. There's the patient aspects, and there's the operator aspects. So the patient should be positioned optimally, should be pre-oxygenated, should be anaesthetised and needs to be neuromuscularly relaxed. The laryngoscopy operator needs to have a primary plan and a primary plan for failure. He needs to be trained in all the techniques that he may or may not need to use and he needs to have given a good team briefing to those around him to make sure that the process can run as smoothly as possible. Once laryngoscopy has actually started, the number of attempts at intubation should be limited to three. There should be the use of techniques to improve access, such as uh, releasing the cricoid pressure slightly or going backward, upward, right, uh, the BERT procedure is, is often known. Where grade 2B or 3A views are suspected, then the use of a bougie or stylus should be used earlier rather than later and perhaps should actually be used straight away and where there's failure after three attempts, move on to B stroke C. Don't mess about. The document then goes on to talk about video laryngoscopy and a video laryngoscope should be available at all times and should be easy to hand on the unit or in the area in which one is working. If difficulties are predicted, then video laryngoscopy should be used at the outset, not as a second thought. If during laryngoscopy there's a poor view with direct laryngoscopy, then you should be using video laryngoscopy. And the final point made in the document about laryngoscopy is that if you're going to use video laryngoscopy, it should have a screen that's visible to everybody so everyone can see the process, which might make it easier for them to comment and to help during a difficult intubation. And then finally, with part A, assuming you've got the tube in the right place, you need to confirm position of the tube. And the gold standard again for that is waveform capnography. So have you got a good waveform on your screen? 
Chest auscultation and x-ray are unreliable signs of a positive intubation. So the waveform capnography should be done. If you can't get a reliable trace, you need to take the tube out, you need to reoxygenate the patient, and you need to start the process again. So that's plan A. Hopefully it's gone fine, your tube is down, everything's safe, you breathe a sigh of relief, you go on to the next thing. What if it's gone wrong though? What if plan A hasn't worked? Well, we've got, I've got another video where we go on to plan B, C. Go and have a look at it. If you enjoy this video, please subscribe to my channel and make any comments down below.